I was very interested in the notes that accompany your new album about the origins of We Free Strings and specifically the home concerts that you used to host. And there's a wonderful long tradition of that in jazz music circles. I was wondering, were you doing so just out of practical necessity or was there, was there more to it for you? Well, I had the good fortune of owning a brownstone in the middle of Harlem, right behind the Harlem State Office building. And uh, I was raising my family with four children, and, uh, but we had more room than we needed. And uh, to, as it happened, um, Katie Roberts had a, uh, what was that piano? I think it was a Usendorfer piano grand piano that she needed to house. So we kept that in our parlor. We had bass and drums and it was basically a community space that we created, you know, just because it seemed like the right thing to do. And um, as over time, as that evolved, um, we keep, we, I became involved with a multi-generational, multicultural group of individuals who would meet at the house and plan events. And those events included um, theater. Uh, we did, <laughs> I kind of created a black box theater in the parlor and we did uh, Robbie Colley's, Robbie McCauley's work, uh, Sally's Rape. We had indigenous uh, activists come and speak about you know, uh, issues within their own communities. We had eco-socialist activities, poets. Um, gee, I think the only thing we didn't have was dance. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, that's understandable. Right, and uh, the group called itself Scientific Soul Sessions, and I called the parlor floor uh, B-flat universe because uh, I, read or heard in a radio interview, uh, some physicists talking about the uh, vibrations that the universe intones, and that was a B flat. <laughs> so um, it seemed appropriate. And uh, yes, We Free Strings was born in that space. Mm -hmm. What's uh, it like for you to be at the center of all that? It was your home after all, what's that like? Uh, it was exhilarating uh, for me uh, and I think for my family as well, because so many individuals passed through there. We had, uh, you know, um, many people rehearsed their Afro horn, uh, oh gosh, I forget, uh, Francisco de Mora's group rehearsed their Afro horn. Um, my former partners groups, Harlem Arts Ensemble rehearsed there. We had, um, thank you, Sia. We had, uh, gee, um, oh my God, we had meetings there. We had um, uh, events. There were so many musician, musicians came through to stay there. Frank Lacey was a regular at, at the house. Hakeem Jami, lived with us for wow. about a year and a half. Um, and, uh, you know, we had Jimmy Hopps popped in and stayed with us for three months, mm. two or three months. And uh, it was very lively, um, very exhilarating, uh, culturally uh, awakening um, for me because of all of the interesting conversations that took place in the kitchen and in the parlor. Uh, you know, we recorded. There must there. have been days though, when you would have liked some alone time. <laughs> I mean, I, had, I raised four kids. There's no such thing as alone time. <laughs> My alone time happens at, well, even still, I, I you know, I've always been nocturnal, hmm. but you know, it's definitely after, nine o'clock and some and always almost always until two at least 2 a.m but i my 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 own time for practicing and other creative things would would happen you know in the 
in the after hours. <laughs> Is this uh, the time that you came to be associated with the Sun Ra Orchestra? No, actually, um, Sun Ra Orchestra asked me, invited me to my first performance with them in 2018. And uh, that was at some little place, not some little place, it was a, actually a warehouse in um, Williamsburg. I don't think I'd ever played in front of that many people. And uh, that was exciting. And, you know, we continued. Uh, recently, I haven't been doing so much with the orchestra and they've been moving around quite a bit. So, um, yeah, I missed the Carnegie Hall thing because I was in Paris with uh, William Parker, which is, you know, that was cool. That's that was, okay. You know. <laughs> oh, okay, that's a, that's a, that's a solid trade-off. Yeah. What What then, is it, do you think, um, about Sun Ra that makes him still such a resonant figure? Well, I think Sun Ra, like so many um, artists, was, first of all, ahead of his time. I mean, we can point to any number of improvisers who are only, whose music is only just being widely listened to and understood and embraced and celebrated. And um, one of the things that I, I've, I went to my first Sun Rock concert in the 80s after a couple of years after I moved to New York to study. And I remember my first thoughts being that he embraced the entire arc of the history of, uh, you know, the music in, uh, in that, you know, in jazz and in and in and beyond what we call jazz, and um, I was, I was completely blown away. I, I felt like I was awash in like a tonal history, a tonal arc, and um, I I heard it all. And I think I think that is an important aspect of what. Um, Keep Sun Ra so relevant is the ability to embrace at once, you know, the past, the present, and the future. Do you think at all about your own musical or artistic legacy? Do you want to be remembered in the same way that he is? Um, I. <laughs> that's a tall order, <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, I guess for myself, I am much more linear. I'm just kind of going project to project and letting the music tell me what it wants to be and trying to make it happen and hoping that people will listen and understand it or enjoy it. I, I, I haven't really thought about legacy in terms of, you know, what one leaves behind. I do think it is important to document uh, one's work. And um, I am, you know, a late stage uh, writer in terms of music. Uh, I really only started writing original music um, in the last eight, well, maybe 10 years. What led you down that path? Because you had been very involved with improvisation. Well, We Free Strings led me down that path. I had an ensemble of um, individuals who all had their own voices and I wanted to see what they could do with what I, with what I wrote. And um, uh, so that was one, one aspect, even though we didn't begin the first iteration of We, Strings, we Free Strings, we were not writing um music and we still you know do uh just improvised pieces but one of the practices we had early on was to record our sessions and um you know i would have wine and food and you know we would spend the afternoons in open rehearsals this was once again in harlem we would spend the afternoon in open rehearsals and record ourselves and then listen back and um, 
in listening back at one point, you know, I became, uh, you know, I took uh, motifs that we discovered during those sessions and began, began to develop them on paper and in arrangements. And those were the first, uh, my first attempts at writing for the ensemble. And how does that process compares, compare to pure improvisation? Well, writing is like, it is hard for me. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, it's a, uh, let's see. Um, pure improvisation, I think is, I like to think of it as a dialogue um, rather than a script. Mm -hmm. and, and so that requires a great deal of listening, uh, you know, a, a level of uh, being able to um, have some command of, you know, your own vocabulary and the vocabulary of, uh, you know, of others to be able to respond to that. Um, so I really think of it as a developing conversation among musicians. Writing is um, something that has its own elements of spontaneity. Um, and uh, I think for me, once I get something on paper, even if it's just a kernel, the music seems to tell me where it wants to go. But for, as a one who is like just, on, I can't even claim to play the piano. Um, but I do use the piano quite a bit. And um, I think uh, that process is in part kind of helps me understand where the music wants to go. Hmm. Um, I don't try to wrangle it, you know. Um, so, so in that sense, there's still a, a level of spontaneity, a level of receiving something from the, you know, somewhere. <laughs> and what the arduous task is trying to get it on paper so that it makes sense to the people that are going to be interpreting it. Uh, you do work with a lot of different musicians. Um, is, that, is that simply a practical consideration that that's how you make a living in music these days? Or um, is there something more to it? Than that? Are you seeking out something in these various partnerships? Um, I, I, at this point, and perhaps at other points, but more so at this point than at any other point in my develop, I think what I'm seeking out is a sense of belonging to a community of individuals who, um, artists who, um, who inspire me, from whom I learn, and um, who that excite me. I mean, I, I'm not, a, I never consider myself a soloist. And um, I find that um, I speak best in um, an ensemble setting because there's a constant, uh, a continuum of uh, energy that uh, flows through the ensemble that I don't seem to be, I mean, at least thus far, I don't seem to be able to create, you know, uh, I don't know, I, I haven't done any solo work. So I haven't found where that, where that, that comes from. Never say never. Oh, I, I'm not saying never. I'm just saying up to this point, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but, I, you know, I, I would be up for the challenge. Strings has always played um, a fascinating role for me in, in jazz music. Um, I think in part because it is so underrepresented. And I'm curious how you landed there and how We Free Strings landed there. Um, is that a is that a curiosity about what strings brings to jazz, or or did you come to that place loving the use of strings in jazz? Where how'd you land there? 
I came to that place uh, seeking a, a different voice for myself on my instrument and understanding that there was more out there than what I, you know, had been exposed to. Um, and uh, I think, you know, before I left my hometown, Colorado, uh, I got turned on to, um, uh, oh my God, am, am I forgetting, my, Michael White. Um, I, I, I got a couple of Michael White albums. You know, I'd heard of uh, Stefan Grappelli, I'd heard of uh, Joe Venuti, and I dug, you know, what that was happening. I guess at the time, in the 80s, Michael Urbaniak was also uh, a happening, you know, situation, but uh, it's a happening artist, you know, just in terms of the sphere of exposure. But when I came to New York, um, I met a man on the street named Aubrey Welsh, who was an older guy, violinist um, in Harlem. And he got me involved with Ken McIntyre's uh, orchestra. And it was there that I first started. It was with Ken's orchestra and also with Joe Ford and Jerry Eastman's Williamsburg Contemporary Composers Orchestra that I first be, began to explore improvisation. And, um, um, and then, you know, and then there was Leroy Jenkins and then there was Billy Bang. And I, I, I just wish I had known sooner. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it was finding a, a black voice mm -hmm. in the music. Mm. was very important to me, you know, uh, especially after coming out of um, years of classical music training. Um, and uh, I, I cannot say that the road was, you know, was easy, but what I did find um, in the music was that, and in the community of practice within the music, was that uh, the level of encouragement for you know earnest effort and seeking out you know one's voice or you know the form of expression was was really phenomenal and um, you know I cannot think of a single instance where I've encountered other improvisers who are not utterly supportive. Hmm. of, you know, what, what we were all trying to do, what I was trying to do, what we were all trying to do. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just glad I found, I, I feel like at this point in my, uh, in my life that I am really where I belong as a musician. And it, it was a journey. <laughs> <laughs> 